morning, everybody. So it's uh, Wednesday morning. You've, if you've been here since the beginning of the course, this is probably like hour 37. So your pro- eyes are bleeding, ears, you can't hear anything anymore, but you finally made it to the Green Path Lectures. So everything should be pretty good. <coughs> My name is uh, Aaron Auerbach. And um, I'm going to be talking, I work at the Joint Pathology Center, formerly was the AFIP. I do uh, some general surge path, I do molecular pathology, and I do hematopathology, also subspecialized in GI pathology. But today we're going to be talking about team path, some of the common stuff we see in a day-to-day practice, as well as some of the more obscure stuff that we might expect on a board exam. And... Um, I just recertified in heme path, so I just, uh, last year I went down the road where some of you guys might be going soon, and um, I went to the evil empire, the American Board of Pathology. I took my exam, and uh, uh, I thought it was, uh, so I consider myself well-versed on this topic. I've taught it for 13 years here. I teach it multiple times a year, and I thought that the heme path re- research was very hard. So not hard because I didn't know the information, but hard because all the things you hear about, photos that are blurry, questions that have two answers that, uh, that are correct, and you have to figure out which one is more correct than the other one. Um, but I try to gear my lectures as much as possible to the boards for this for this course, I try to come up with things that I think would be high yield, most likely to come up on exams. It's hard to be uh, absolutely certain because you never know what kind of questions people are going to write, but you can find patterns that you see over uh, uh, come up again over time. So um, that's the kind of stuff I'm going to focus on. So for the first two hours, we're going to talk about lymph nodes. We'll go for an hour, and then we'll take a break. I think there's a break at 10 o'clock. If for some reason I go over, remind me, and we'll stop immediately at 10 o'clock to take the break. Um, As far as lymph nodes go, the outline, there's a lot of details. The outline is fairly simple. We're going to talk about reactive lymph nodes. (coughs) Then we're going to talk about small B-cell lymphomas, large B-cell lymphomas, then Hodgkin's lymphomas, then T-cell lymphomas. So when you come up with (coughs) board-related lectures, one kind of issue that you always have is, should you deal with stuff, uh, how current topics should you deal with? And uh, the lectures, we talk about that all the time. I tend to, I tend to go as current information as possible. As many of you may know, there's, the 2016 revision of the 2008 WHO is going to come out in February. And so the WHO is, and HEMPATH is kind of what we use as our Bible for classification. And it's about to come out. So there is um, new information that I've added in here. Sometimes I've added the photos, sometimes I haven't. And I think it, again, I think it's best, you never know whether the questions are going to be dated questions that use older terminology, or whether they're going to have asked questions from people, and the research topics are going to be this kind of very new, cutting-edge classification stuff. I did notice some of that on my board examination. So I think it's most beneficial with this kind of a lecture to give you the most up-to-date classification, and that's what we're going to do. So if there's any questions afterwards about some of the terminology of a couple of these newer entities, I'm happy to further explain them. But first of all, just looking at a reactive lymph node. <coughs> at low power, we see that there are, um, in this reactive lymph node towards the outside, we see the outer cortex. These round areas are our primary follicles, which are the ones where we do not see a germinal center. Next to it, this one is a secondary follicle. It's got the lighter, round germinal center in the middle of it. In between the cortex, we have our paracortical areas we'll talk about. And in the deep center of of the lymph node, what's this area called? 
either the hilum. The hilum has lots of these sinuses, which is what we're seeing here. And then down here, what's this round structure? Again, a germinal center. We can see that it's a reactive germinal center because it is, contains these tingible body macrophages, which are the clear areas. It's surrounded by what zone? The mantle zone. And at higher power, we see the tingible body macrophages. And if we're, it, when we look at a germinal center, another way that we can tell it's reactive is if we see polarization of the germinal center. Um, so you, if you stare at a germinal center, you can see that there's a dark zone, which I'm showing you here in the upper left, and a lighter zone in the lower right. And that's because there's antigen going through the uh, different areas of the germinal center. Um, and just, again, just a feature of a reactive uh, germinal center. To look at some immunohistochemical stains on germinal centers, they could show you photos of an immuno, and you have to know the staining pattern uh, to know which immuno it is. That's kind of a game they can play on the boards. They can show you a photo and ask you which immuno stain is it. So here, just looking at germinal centers, we see this is a B cell marker like CD20 uh, because it's uh, staining the germinal center uh, pretty much almost all the cells. Here, CD3 is considered negative in the germinal center, but we do see that it does stain scattered, reactive appearing uh, T cells. BCL6 is positive in the germinal center, as is CD10. And they could ask you which stain is BCL6 and which is CD10. So, how do we know this one is the BCL6, other than it says it's at the bottom? Because it's a nuclear stain, you see the, in, the nuclear uh, most inner area of each cell is positive, where here CD10 is a cytoplasmic stain, so it's only staining the cytoplasm, not, if you look very closely, the nuclei. And CD21 marks the follicular dendritic meshworks. These are the framework uh, of the germinal center. It has this dendritic or string-like pattern to it. And we know that BCL2 is negative in a germinal center. IgD is another stain that we do that uh, selectively stains the mantle zones. And then when we talk about reactive lymph nodes, in real life, and especially for the boards, first thing you have to do is determine whether a lymph node is benign or malignant. But the second thing you need to do, uh, if it's benign, is to give some guesses as why the patient might have a prominent lymph node, even if it's not lymphoma. And so in the classification of these reactive conditions, we, we look at different patterns of disease. So if the follicles are increased in number, we call it follicular hyperplasia, and there's a differential diagnosis. If the paracortex is expanded, we call it paracortical hyperplasia, and there's a differential diagnosis. And if the sinuses are expanded, we call that the sinus pattern. And there, uh, there's a differential diagnosis. And we'll talk about some of these next. So again, this follicular pattern is seen in many things, Castleman's disease, HIV-related lymphadenopathy. It's also seen in rheumatoid lymphadenopathy, where we see, in addition to the uh, reactive follicles, we see polytypic plasma cells, as well as neutrophils, mostly in the sinuses. And if a patient has had long-standing syphilis and it involves a lymph node, we actually also see um, those plasma cells, but we see them in relation to a very thick capsule. And we can then do uh, Worf and Sari stains to prove that, uh, to find the uh, organisms that's in syphilis. And here's an example of reactive follicular hyperplasia. We see reactive follicles. They're no longer just at the outer cortex, but they're throughout the lymph node, and they contain, they look reactive with a light and dark zone, tingible body macrophages, and a mantle zone surrounding them. And in real life, and for the boards, you may have to compare follicular hyperplasia with follicular lymphoma. On the left is characteristics of hyperplasia. On the right are characteristics of follicular lymphoma. Follicular hyperplasia shows much more polymorphic cells, where lymphoma looks monotonous. Um, Unlike other carcinomas where we expect a high KI67 with 
neoplasia. It's the opposite often in um, follicular lymphoma where a reactive germinal center will have a high proliferative rate, whereas follicular lymphoma will often have a low mitotic rate. Um, again, you will not expect to see those tentacle body macrophages in follicular lymphoma. If we do immunistic chemistry, the germinal centers are commonly negative for BCL2 in follicular hyperplasia, but positive for BCL2 uh, in follicular lymphoma. And of course, we know that the T1418 translocation occurs in lymphoma, not in hyperplasia. So here's comparing follicular hyperplasia on the left with lymphoma on the right. We see at low power that in hyperplasia we have increased follicles, but they tend not to be back to back. They tend not to be coalescing. Here's lymphoma. The nodules are uh, coalescing into each other. We don't see any tentacle body macrophages. It looks very monotonous. Again, at high power, hyperplasia on the left, light and dark zone. Uh, and very heterogeneous. On the right is follicular lymphoma. It all looks the same, monotonous, no tentacle body macrophages, no mantle zone. Okay, talking about some of the other types of follicular hyperplasia, here's one. We see uh, secondary follicles, uh, we see an enlarged lymph node, and follicular hyperplasia throughout the lymph node but the follicles have a very small appearance to them. We call those atretic germinal centers. And if we look at them closer in some areas, you might see two follicles in one germinal center. And here's the sign, this uh, picture showing a germinal center that has a blood vessel uh, coming out of the center of it. And what are these all features of? Yeah, Castleman's disease. Sorry, here's another photo showing plasma cells in the background. And so Castleman's disease would be kind of a very high yield topic for the boards. It is often kind of a diagnosis of exclusion, but if you really know of all the different components that you see in Castleman disease, you can make the diagnosis. We know that these commonly occur in the mediastinum. Again, they often have these small atretic germinal centers Twinning is the term for where we have multiple germinal centers in one follicle. We see um, classic on the boards an expanded mantle zone, uh, which we call onion skinning, or the, the appearance of uh, this concentric layers of the mantle zone outside of the germinal center looks kind of like the skin of an onion. The radio, the lollipop sign is this sign which again is a germinal center that has what we call a radial penetrating arteriole, which is a little blood vessel that's coming out of the germinal center perpendicularly. We see um, uh, increased plasmacytic monocytes. Um, we know that the, we can find these because they stain positively for CD123. And when we categorize Castleman's disease, we either say that it's unicentric or multicentric. And there's really a difference between Unicentric occurs in one site, and the ones that are multicentric that occur in multiple sites. Um, in the unicentric ones, we either look for hyaline or plasma cells in the background. Um, and these are often treated by surgery. They usually do not um, recur, and uh, they have a good prognosis. On the other hand, in multicentric Castleman disease, these patients, kind of high yield for the boards, frequently also have an HHV-8 infection. They can have um, increased serum IL-6, uh, which is a marker that encodes for the HHV-8. These patients do worse. They have a worse prognosis. They often need steroids or chemotherapy. And for the boards, you should remember that the multicenter Castleman's disease are associated with plasmablastic lymphoma, Kaposi's C sarcoma, and primary fusion lymphoma. They're also associated with HIV, with Scott Aldrich syndrome, uh, myasthenia gravis, and this POEM syndrome. And you'll remember for the boards that POEM stands for polyneuropathy, organomegaly for the O, endocrinopathy for the E, monoclonic gammopathy is the M in POEMs, and skin lesions is the S. And so, um, again, high yield. High yield for the boards would be looking at these different associations 
with a multicentric Castleman's disease. Now, patients with HIV can get lymphoma, but they can also get big reactive lymph nodes. And we know that when they get reactive lymph nodes, that the lymph nodes can undergo a few different stages. Um, those stages are the follicular hyperplasia stage, which then leads to the follicular involution, which then leads to the follicular depletion stage of HIV lymphadenopathy. In the follicular hyperplasia, we see um, uh, basically these large irregular germinal centers. With follicular involution, the germinal centers tend to get smaller in size, uh, and they're often replaced by histiocytes. And then finally, with follicular depletion, the lymph nodes are no longer enlarged. They tend to be small. They lose their follicles. Instead, they have histiocytes and erythrophagocytosis. And so here's the follicular hyperplasia stage of HIV. You get these large, irregularly shaped germinal centers, often surrounded by um, increased clear monocytes. Here's the follicular involution stage. So now we don't see those follicular germinal centers. It might, you might confuse this for follicular lymphoma or some other lymphoma. And finally, in the depletion, you, you're losing your lymphocytes. Instead, there's fibrosis, um, decreased follicles, increased follicular dendritic cells. And here are some, is some erythrophagocytosis. Okay, next disease. So say you're, you have a lymph node and you see that there's follicular hyperplasia, but then we see these epithelial histiocytes within the germinal centers. And out, here's the germinal center. Outside of the germinal center, we see these large areas of monocytoid B cells. Yeah, if you see um, follicular hyperplasia, uh, intraepithelial histiocytes and monocytoid B cell hyperplasia, that's the classic triad for toxoplasma. So patients are infected with toxoplasma. It's quite common. It actually turns out that 50% of adults will have antibodies to toxoplasma, so many of us have been exposed to it, even though we may not know um, that we were. Um, you get enlarged lymph nodes. Sometimes the lymph nodes are taken out to rule out lymphoma. But if you see this triad of hyper, follicular hyperplasia, intrafollicular epithelial histiocytes, and monocytoid B cells, those aren't specific. You do, you're not seeing the organism, but that tells you this could be taxoplasma, and you then go back and request that they do serologic testing or PCR to prove that the patient has taxo. But again, we do not actually see the toxocyst in a lymph node. Okay, so that was talking about some of the types of follicular hyperplasia. Moving on to paracortical hyperplasia. We know that this is expansion of the paracortex, usually because there's T cells in the paracortex, so it's some immunologic response of the T cells. Classically, it's caused by either drugs uh, with phen uh, dilantin or phenytoin being the common one, vaccines, and viruses. Um, so, you know, my clients are often active duty, and um, active duty are required when they, before they go abroad, they're required to get the anthrax vaccine. And we've had many cases of very large in lymph nodes right after the patients have had their anthrax vaccine. And we look at the lymph nodes, and it's just paracortical hyperplasia. <clears throat> so ultimately, if you look at this, at this photo, there's a germinal center up here. But this more clear modeled area is our paracortex. And if you look at it at higher power, you can see that there's these large atypical cells in the paracortex, prominent nucleoli. So you, you, these are reactive immunoblasts. You don't want to confuse them with Reed Sternberg cells. They do have a prominent nucleoli, but they're just a reactive uh, lymphocyte. And we can see that they can be, they can stain positive for CD30, which is also a marker for Reed Sternberg cells. But in the context of a reactive lymph node that has its architecture in, intact, you need to remember that these are just reactive uh, hyper. 